Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our fall candidate forum with the District 8 candidates for the City of Phoenix City Council. My name is Diane Haller. I'm the board chair for the Phoenix Community Alliance. Um, and I also want to welcome our virtual participants today. Um, thank you for those of you who couldn't come in person, but thank you especially for those who could. Um, before we start our program today, I want to thank ASU and the Thunderbird School of Global Management for this beautiful venue that we're in today. Um, we've been at this venue once before, but it was before they actually opened for students, and so it's nice to be here with the students. And I also want to thank Elastic Catering for the food that we have today, and I want to thank our staff, Cindy and Patrick and the irrepressible Leah Tan, who is back at the back. And yes, a big clap for Leah. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator of our program today, Ruben Alvarez. He is the managing partner at Malera Alvarez here in Phoenix. Good afternoon and welcome. As uh, Diane mentioned, I'm Ruben Alvarez and I have the honor of serving as chair of PCA's uh, Public Affairs Committee. And I will be serving as today's moderator. Um, the structure for the forum is as follows. Each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves and provide an opening statement. Each candidate will then be asked questions related to issues important to the membership of PCA and have two minutes to respond to each question. And lastly, each candidate will have two minutes to provide a closing statement. And for the candidates, uh, Patrick is sitting right in front and he has a 60 second and a 10 second time card to let you know um, how much time you have available. Before we begin with the opening statements, I want to inform those watching virtually that questions in the chat will not be answered during the forum, but they will be followed up once responses are received. And now, to get us started, I'd like to ask each candidate to, in two minutes or less, introduce yourself to our guest, and we are gonna begin in alphabetical order by last name, which means Denise Ceballos Weiner, you are first. Good morning, everyone. My name is Denise Ceballos Weiner. I am one of your candidates for District 8 City Council. And um, I am running for City Council because I care about this city. I came to Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona in 1986, um, originally from the Dominican Republic, was born in Dominican Republic, raised in New York, and was given an opportunity in 1986 to move to Phoenix. Um, because culture is so important to me, I decided to open a dance studio, uh, not too far from here, probably about half a mile from here, and um, was able to introduce my culture, music, and dance to the community. Through that experience, I was able to meet so many great um, citizens and families and children that were in uh, need of uh, support, emotional support. So I turned my dance studio into an empowerment program. And doing that, I was also been given the opportunity to grow and notice the need in our community and the families. And um, that's one of the reasons why I decided to run for city council, because I believe that we need a great representation. Um, I see this city grow. I welcome the growth in this, in this great uh, Phoenix metropolitan area. Coming from New York City, when I first came to uh, Phoenix, I, I was always wishing to see the grow. I wanted to see the buildings. I wanted to see the restaurants as we, I was able to experience in downtown New York City. So it is a pleasure for me to be here, and I hope that I can uh, be here at your service. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next is Carlos Garcia. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having this and thank you to PCA and its members for having this great forum. Um, last week we all got to meet each other, so this is the second time we're in the same space. Um, Carlos Garcia, I've been fortunate enough to represent a portion of downtown for the last three years. Um, the last three years have been really heavy on all of us. I think six months into office, no, none of us knew or thought this pandemic was gonna happen 
but I'm really grateful I was there um, for the growth of myself and my ability to be able to connect with the needs that the community had. Um, I was just talking earlier, 15 years ago, I worked for ASU at uh, Resident Life, and we opened up the first dorm here, and I was fortunate enough to, to you know, work, have a job, go to ASU, but we were able to bring in um, you know, the, the desk and, and set up the first dorm room and to now be here in this amazing space and seeing the growth that ASU has brought to downtown um, is really exciting. And I think in the conversation today, we'll definitely talk about the role that city government has had in that growth, which I think has is, is been great. Um, but definitely now that times have changed, how do we adjust to that? And I think one thing from this forum and, and for the rest of y'all, if, if you happen to be the, the district eight person, um, counting on partners like PCA, I think is crucial um, to be able to solve things as they come along. One example I give is um, when the pandemic hit and restaurants you know, were, were suffering downtown, we were able to quickly move uh, to open outdoor seating for businesses um, to be able to make sure that both folks are safe, that we're patronizing the, the businesses, but also that the businesses could be successful and also include some drive-through and other options. So really excited for the questions today and happy to be here. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Carlos. And next is uh, Nick Grimsman. Hello, my name is Nick Grimsman, and I've lived in District 8 for over 10 years. Uh, my background is in behavior health and public administration. I was a behavior health administrator. I oversaw million dollar budgets, uh, over uh, probably about five programs. I've built programs from bottom to floor. I understand uh, how to deal with uh, all the red tape and all the funding and all that stuff. And I really love Phoenix. I would like to see more growth in Phoenix. We have the housing thing we have to work on and uh, downtown is uh, really important to the city, so I'm thankful to be here. I'm the type of person that listens to the experts, that is able to uh, look at statistics and talk to people, constituents and everybody involved, and I'm fiscally responsible, so I believe in streamlining programs, streamlining things at the city to make things easier for everybody involved. And um, my background also includes, I was a volunteer chaplain at the Phoenix Children's Hospital. I volunteered helping others for over 15 years. And I write books and I travel uh, for the nonprofit that I currently am a director of. So um, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. And last, uh, Keisha Hodge Washington. Good afternoon, I am Keisha Hodge Washington, and like the rest of them, I am a candidate for Phoenix City Council. Um, I am running because I see a need for intentional and strategic responses to the problem that are facing our cities. I like to pride myself as a professional problem solver and consensus builder. I have served, I have been a resident and an attorney practicing in this state for 23 years and 20 of my years I have been in, in this district. I have served in a numerous capacities. I had ranged from small community service organizations to serving as my HOA president, to serving on the Arizona Bar Association, serving on the American Bar Association. I think we need an intentional and strategic approach to the way we address our problems. Number one, being our homeless situation. And two, we need to deal with some economic um, situations that we have. I think that the downtown growth that we have seen in the redevelopment is a great example of what private and public partnerships can look like. And I'm in favor of more of those types of um, initiatives. I, have, what, I came to Arizona on a three-year plan. It turned out to be a 23-year journey. Like many others, I fell in love with the city and what it offers. And I want to continue to expand that opportunity for others. We are the fifth largest, fifth largest city in this state, I'm sorry, in the nation, and we can do a whole lot more. I like to say I'm an advocate by training, but I'm more so an advocate by heart. It is my heart that led me into the decision to run for Phoenix City Council. I see a need for us to do more by our residents, and I want to work on identifying what those policies can look like. I think the city has the propensity to set the guidelines for the rest of the nation, and we do so by having a plan of action and not just simply going with the flow. So I have a plan and some ideas on how we can move city of Phoenix forward. So thank you, and I look forward to sharing more of those with you as we move forward. Thank you. 
Thank you. Now we realize two minutes is not a lot of time for each of the candidates to share about, uh, information about their background. So if you'd like to find out a little bit more about them individually, their website is on, on, online here. So please feel free to um, go and, and, and take a look at their background. And lastly, I ask each candidate, if you can, just uh, lift the microphone up a little bit closer. That way we can hear you a little bit better because we do have students roaming the halls. So thank you so much. Uh, moving on to the question and answer section. Again, the topic for each question was generated from our PCA membership, and each candidate will have two minutes to answer the question. The first topic is on homelessness. Greater downtown Phoenix is disproportionately affected by the homelessness crisis. What actions will you take as a council member that specifically relate to greater downtown Phoenix to address this proportionate impact? And we're gonna start with uh, Carlos Garcia. Thank you for the question. I think it's, it's the number one topic or the number one issue we should all be talking about. Um, like I've shared before, you know, when we first opened the CAS, and that was the city and the county, the, the Central Arizona Shelter Project, um, in the early 90s, it was one of six that were planned um, to be able to address the issue. Our city's obviously grown a lot since then. You know, it's been mentioned with the fifth largest city in the country, and we need to make sure we address this issue. Um, three months ago, we were able to open the second shelter. We opened it on 28th Street in Washington. And we did it with some of the lessons learned from our previous attempts here, but also from lessons from around the country. The second shelter that was opened for 200 people has wraparound services. People are able to stay there the entire day. And the focus is to try to get them to be housed um, as soon as possible or to get their, meets, their needs addressed um, with whatever those may be. The second part of this question, beyond getting shelter and supporting those who may be unsheltered now, is definitely raising our housing stock. We're 150,000 beds, 150,000 units short of what we need to have in this city. We obviously, for the last 10 years, have been the fastest growing city in the country. So we have more and more people moving here, but at the same time, we're also uh, having raising uh, rent and housing prices. And so, again, with the pandemic, the population has doubled. And what's important for us to do is, as a city is to put our own skin in the game. I think for the last, even as we had this debate three years ago, the person I was debating at the time was asking for other cities to do what they can. I think as the largest city in the state, as one of the largest city in the country, we actually have to lead by example and be able to use our resources to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Nick? So, this, so uh, homelessness is a, a really big issue in Phoenix, like Carlos said. Um, you know, there's different um, types of individuals that are dealing uh, with being unsheltered. Uh, one could be the people that have been evicted. There's a portion that are struggling with SMI, which is seriously mental, serious mental illness. And then there's a vast portion that a lot of people don't talk about is we have a problem with drugs in our community. We have a problem with the fentanyl coming in and destroying families and putting a lot of people on the street. Just yesterday in my neighborhood, I went to the local Walgreens and as I was getting into my car, there was three individuals about uh, maybe six feet from my car and they were uh, playing with some aluminum foil and they had their pens in their mouth and they were smoking fentanyl uh, openly right on the street at 51st Avenue Baseline. So we can't really uh, 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 push this aside. We have a real big problem here and I think homelessness um, really is uh, a county issue because a lot of people go from Tempe to Mesa, they push them maybe into Phoenix, they go up to Scottsdale, Scottsdale does, you know, maybe tries to help them, then they move somewhere else. So I believe this is a county issue and I wanna advocate for the county and the state to work as partners more to come up with real solutions. And so that's, that's my plan is to make this a county and a state issue more than a city issue. Thank you. Keisha? We're 
With respect to the homeless situation, I will agree that downtown Phoenix has been disproportionately affected by the homeless crisis. What actions I would take as a result, I think the number one issue we need to do is prepare additional units for the homeless situation that we do have. We need to have a place so that we can, individuals can be treated humanely and get the services that they need. I think that the city has been doing a decent job in creating more units. However, it simply has not kept up with the demand. The housing plan has an estimated projection of 2030 as when you will have sufficient units. That's, seven, that's 78 years from now, that is inadequate. I think we need more intermediate um, housing resources, not necessarily in the form of shelters. I think the tiny homes and the pallets are a great way of, uh, the pallet homes are a great way for us to provide units that provide for a sense of stability and dignity for our individuals facing homelessness so that they're able to have a place where they can receive those services. I also believe that the city can do a better job. I, I believe that we are the leaders uh, of the city. We run, we, we lead the state and we have to lead by example. We need to get more of our regional and our sister cities to buy in. There are some programs that have worked well in other cities that we can implement here in Phoenix, such as the city of Chandler. They do have similar to uh, mental health um, initiative that focuses on the mental health services that we need here. As Nick mentioned, there is a large population of our individuals that have mental health and we need to figure out how to treat them. We also need to ensure that, um, that it is proportionally spread throughout the city of Phoenix. Um, no one district should bear the entire lion's share of the burden. And I think we do so by um, showing individuals that we, showing other parts of the city, that we can do it in a way that is humane, respectful, sanitary, clean, and we don't have the propensity for, for it to continue to grow, but it can be controlled. The other thing I would wanna make sure that we do as a city is, is um, work on eviction differences uh, diversion, because we don't want individuals that continue to add to the growing problem. We want to keep people in their homes. So, thank you. Thank you. Lastly, Denise. Um, we need to learn to identify the different kind of homelessness. We have some that have mental illness. We have some that have drug issues. And we also have some that do prefer to sleep live in the streets. There is a program that many of us know that is Phoenix Care. The information that I receive is that a lot of time when they are sent to get help, many of them refuse help. We also have the mental illness that we need to create the shelter and treat them accordingly. We need to make sure that they are safe when they go into the programs, especially the women. I have one of the parents call me last week to let me know that her daughter was, uh, just came from Prescott um, to, to try to clean herself from the drugs that she has been using for months. And um, the minute that she came back, she was in suicidal mode. She was taken back in, she was arrested and taken in to another facility in Avondale and she called her mother and she told her mother, I do not want to be here because last time I was in one of these facility, I was violated and I was raped. So we need to learn to identify what is causing our men and our women and our children to get into drugs. And I think that this is an issue that we all have to work together as a community. We gotta get churches involved. We have to support any organizations that are, are, are giving these um, services to our community. We need to identify those who do not want to be clean, do not want any help. And then we also need to identify those who are in that circle and they are criminals and they are selling drugs and, and they are not helping with the healing and the cleansing of our own shelter. Thank you. So the next topic is transportation and infrastructure. Public and private transportation, streets, parking, and accessibility for pedestrians, cars, trains, buses, e-scooters, and bicycles present an ongoing and unique set of challenges in our urban core. What are your top two priorities to address these issues, especially in the downtown area? And we are gonna start with uh, Nick. The downtown area is uh, really unique because it has so many diverse individuals 
And I think it would be really neat to have a downtown eventually that maybe would be carless to where it would be walking and e-scooters or maybe trolleys or shuttles or something, but where you could almost eliminate the cars and then have a whole diverse, dense downtown where people are walking and knowing their neighbor and uh, having just, um, just a different atmosphere here because this is a, a beautiful city and, a, and the, the downtown can really uh, uh, be something really beautiful. Uh, so the second, so that's the first one. So looking at the downtown and looking at how people, the mobility here. And then also, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of, I'm the kind of guy that goes out there a little bit. I like to have visions and I like to, you know, have a vision and things. And I always wondered, I know it might be impossible, but has anybody ever thought about going underground here and doing things underground or is there too many pipes and all that stuff? I don't really know, but it would be really neat to see new innovative ideas come to this city. And, you know, you have the light rail and you have all that awesome things. But what about going underground, uh, doing parking structures underground or I, I don't even I don't know, but I like to. Um, I like to think of new innovative ideas. And so as a city council person, I would be the person that would talk with all these different organizations and developers and, and figure out what's innovative and new. And uh, yeah. Thanks. Isha? So the, top, so the top two priorities in addressing the issue in the urban core, I would focus primarily on private and pri public transportation, specifically making it more affordable and reliable and consistent and in a manner that allows for more individuals to actually use the transportation that we currently involve. I know many individuals do not use the public transportation because of the homeless situation or they don't feel safe on those structures. And I think we definitely need to address those things. I am also in favor of expansion. I love the e-scooters, the, the, the less people we have on our streets, I think, or in our vehicles, I should say, on our streets, I think, I think is actually better for us from a safety perspective because it increases pedestrian mobility and walkability throughout the city. And it also helps environmentally. We cut down on all of the green gases. We, can, we, we, help, keep this, we keep, help keep the city cool. So those would be my primary two focuses, um, is ensuring that we have a walkable downtown and a communable downtown with sufficient parking. Um, it could be a, a number of things like incentivizing more shared parking between communities and organizations. Um, many, uh, many residents have now transitioned. Some of them are able to have, um, let, not have to take their vehicles to get to places. And I think we just need to continue to strengthen and build on those. I think the light rail was a step in the, in, was a step in the right direction. We just need to increase more um, location, more drop off, more spots. The expansion of it, I think, is going to be helpful in keeping our city walkable and commutable for all individuals. So. Um, and I definitely, for the buses, I definitely want to see them become more of an electric fleet that can actually sustain the type of um, heat that we see here in the city and make sure that people are able to use them in a way that they're intended to be. So those are my priorities from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Denise? It's two seconds. There, you're fine. I forgot to turn it on. When I came to Phoenix, Arizona in 1986 from New York City, it was very hard and difficult to get around. I remember being living in a city where underground transportation, subways, train, well, it's available 24 seven, made me realize that Phoenix needed, needed to, to improve. And I say that because I remember in the early 90s when I, um, I have to take one bus and walk another half a mile in 115 degrees while I was seven, eight months pregnant so I can get to Macayos right here on Central in Indianola. And I remember thinking, we need better transportation. So I welcome any grow, but I do welcome growing responsibly because unfortunately, when we drive in certain areas, we see the unsheltered of repopulating the bus stops. And we see them in our bus, uh, trans and the transport, public transportation system, and this is one of the reasons why many people are still using their cars. This is because they don't feel safe. I mean, we just had an incident when a lady just got hit on the head in one of the, the public transportation. So, um, and also I, I believe that street lights, 
We need to traffic lights. We need to make sure that we hold those irresponsible drivers accountable. That way, our young men and women who are attending college, our downtown visitors feel safe across the street without having to fear being hit by a car. But I think that I, I am proud of where Phoenix has come from it's since 1986, and I'm, and I'm hoping and I'm willing and to help and see it grow some more. Thank, Thank you. you. Carlos? Thank you. You know, downtown every day, every time I see an ambassador, amazing people, it reminds me of Hans. So last year, almost two years ago, we, we lost um, a, a crucial person of downtown. One of our Phoenix ambassadors was riding home um, and was run over and, and unfortunately passed away. Number one is safety. We need to figure out how to do pedestrian and cyclist safe thoroughfares throughout downtown, both coming in and heading out of downtown. Um, I think micro mobility, I was fortunate enough to come on council when we voted for the pilot program and now we see the mobility. And as we're looking out these windows, we see people walking around and it's beautiful, but we need to make sure that those folks are, are safe. There's possibilities, I know ASU has some plans and others have plans of actually closing down some of these streets and making them pedestrian only or, or micro mobility only through these streets. I think we have to work, continue to work through those things. We have an opportunity now and working towards more downtown specific uh, transportation circulation that brings and connects people from different parts of downtown. Um, I think that's gonna be a priority uh, moving forward. Um, and yes, the city was built um, with cars in mind and we've shifted. The density downtown um, has obviously increased. And so we need to learn to use the tools that we've passed, whether it's the Woo code and planning or the new Vision Zero plan that we were able to approve a couple of months ago um, that had failed a couple of times before on council. These new tools allow us to actually look at street corners or specific areas like downtown and develop the infrastructure that's needed to keep people safe and make sure that they could connect to each other in the downtown area. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question pertains to the city's development efforts. Real estate development in Phoenix faces unique challenges. Do you believe the city should participate financially or other ways to facilitate quality private development in greater downtown Phoenix? If so, how? And if not, why? And we are going to start with Keisha. I do believe that the city should participate in facilitating quality private development in the downtown area. Um, I believe that support should come also financially, and I think it should come in the ways of, when, when appropriate, the appropriate incentives. And the reason I believe so is because one of the things that I think downtown struggles with is affordable housing units. And in order to do so, you, you, we can't mandate that a developer um, build affordable units. However, if we partner with that developer, we can ensure as part of that deal that there are a certain number of affordable housing units. And I think that for me would be one of the motivators in partnering with the development world in, in, in construction here in the greater Phoenix downtown area. I also believe that it's important for private and public partnerships to work together. And I think we can also do that in the commercial world as well. I think one of the things that the City of Phoenix can do better is, is make itself a more um, appealing destination for, or, I'm sorry, branded destination for certain types of activities. Similar to how New Mexico is known for the balloon flights or Scottsdale has the um, ox car auction. I think Phoenix has a lot of amenities that we can also market. And I think some of that requires private partnerships to help move that forward. So from a financial standpoint, I think the city can work with Brandon on those types of aspects in order to market the downtown area um, even greater. Um, because that marketing brings in more individuals into the city for economic reasons. We bring in more jobs. We bring in more opportunities for the business owners. And we bring in a greater tax base for the city as a whole. So I do believe in, I do believe in the right balance of private and part, uh, public partnerships with the city as well as um, private development. Thank you. Uh, Denise? Private development in downtown Phoenix is extremely important. Um, again... 
I love, I love downtown Phoenix because I've seen it grow. And I think that bringing people here, that it will help the development of the economy because it will bring more businesses, uh, more restaurants, and more culture. Um, one of the reasons, again, why I myself decided to bring, uh, create, uh, open a dance studio right here in downtown Phoenix was because I saw the lack, the lacking of culture, and I am so proud of where we are right now. Um, but at the same time, I think that we need to partner with developers, and we need to uh, build responsibly. We need to make sure that our that our city members, our, our voters, our constituents are completely uh, part of this planning. I believe that it's going to bring growth again, and I think that it's, it's, it's something that we can work together with the right partners. Uh, the finance, uh, the financing uh, situation that they can bring in the growth to, of the city of Phoenix. So I'm definitely open to uh, partner up and talk to developers and uh, bring private development to downtown Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> being in, in a school, I, I think back to, you know, thinking through concepts, right? When in school or in theory you're presented either lazy fair or strong state, and, and you, you present it in either or. And I think some of the things that I've learned while being here, while being in office and also learning more of what's happened downtown, is that there's certain times where you want to be able to, you know, help more as a state. One example, I don't think anyone here or anyone watching will have any uh, objection to what happened with the bioscience right, with, with the entire campus, with all that's brought to downtown. No one would object to that. That idea wasn't a plan, right? I mean, some folks would have thought about it, but the original concept was to try to get the Cardinal Stadium there. Um, but when that didn't happen, a group of folks were able to have the vision, come together, and present us with what we have now, which is amazing companies that have come from all over the world, um, and, and the growth that we've seen in downtown Phoenix. I couldn't imagine a downtown Phoenix without having those partners here, U of A, ASU, and so on. Um, and so I, I do think, especially when it comes to affordable housing, when it comes anything that's owned by the city, we, we should be able to provide it to the needs that we have in a current situation. Right now, affordable housing is our biggest need. We have, and in our affordable housing plan, have put our stock, the city-owned properties, to become available to make sure that we have affordable housing. And so I think, you know, I'll close off with the conversation we're having on council now around giplets, right? Some people might agree with them, might disagree with them. But 20 years ago, where downtown was, we needed them. Whether you agree with them or not, it allowed us to be where we're at. Are they needed in the same fashion now? Probably not. But is there an ability now to make sure that we get community benefits from these agreements and still come forward and make these deals happen? I believe so. And so really, you know, looking forward to figuring out what those needs are and how we can meet them with city resources. Thank you. Nick? I'm a, no I'm a, numbers, <laughs> I'm a numbers guy. So if the numbers work out, uh, then I'm all for it. I think development is really important especially when our city is growing. And if the numbers work out, it works for me because the city is gonna continue to grow. People love Phoenix, they're gonna come here and we need to have a lot of new development, new ideas. My favorite subject uh, at NAU was sustainability. So I would be uh, willing to um, work with developers that are really into sustainability and how to have more shade in the uh, city and to keep it cool here. So I really, uh, I really like development and I think it's, uh, it's just a, a great thing and I want to see more of it. And I'm a numbers guy. Thank you. Um, now we're gonna shift our attention to neighborhoods. Uh, vibrant neighborhoods are a key component of a vibrant urban core. What action items can the Phoenix Mayor and City Council take to increase to appeal and attract individuals and families of all income levels to the urban core? And we're going to start with Denise. Yes, what would the City Council do to appeal and attract uh, families and individuals from all income levels to come live and um, work in downtown area? I think that diversity 
cultural program is something that always brings families to any city. And um, anything that you offer to a family, children specifically, families will come. As long as we offer a safe city, uh, as long as we offer safe programs, as long as we offer anything that will allow the family to feel part of it. And I think that we can do, we, we're doing great. Um, I think that we can do more. Uh, the growing of the city will allow us, we have so many people moving in from any part of the, the United States. I am one of them. I am from Dominican Republic. And one of the reasons, again, why I decided to open my studio is because I needed to bring culture to Arizona. 1986 all the way to probably 1997, we were still a little bit flat. But when we, once we started bringing programs into the city, the, the family started to come. And I think that we can create, uh, working together with the uh, city council, the mayor, and, and partnering up with different organizations uh, different cultural organization and family and uh, bringing awareness of culture. I think that is going to attract more people to our city and to our state. Thank you. Uh, Carlos? <clears throat> so our, our neighborhoods around downtown are shifting, right? It's not the same old Garfield. It's not the same old um, Nuestros Barrios area. They're shifting. And I think they're all different. And so I think the first thing we need to do is strengthen those neighborhoods. Currently, we have uh, neighborhood service specialists who help organizations in each neighborhood, um, like the Garfield organization who hosted us last week is one great example of a really successful neighborhood that we can partner with to advocate for their needs. For example, from Garfield to downtown, um, we're currently working on, on, on some safety issues heading there, but you know, thinking through what is a bike boulevard, a pedestrian boulevard, to really making folks entry into downtown better. Um, I also think I, I agree with the events part. You know, we hosted two weeks ago El Grito event. We had 6,000 people come down downtown, a walkable event. Uh, people really enjoyed it. You know, we, sh we were able to shut down Adams. I think we need to do more of that. We've had conversations over the last three years. Obviously, it's derailed a little bit with the pandemic and also with the construction that's happening. But I think as soon as that construction's uh, done, we're going to have the opportunity to reintroduce downtown to a lot of people that may not have to come work here, or may you know, only come for a game or, or a concert, but actually creating programming and things for them to come to. Um, the other, uh, the last thing I'll close with is, you know, how do we also give to those communities I'm thinking through what's happening um, on the south central area with the APS charging station and the beautification that's going to happen there and how the community was engaged to make sure um, that that represented the folks that used to live there. Very similar to what we did on 7th Street and, and Roosevelt with the charging station there. That's now a row row entrance, right? That's how you look at it. That's how you see it. And so how do we welcome folks? How do we create programming? And how do we strengthen those communities so that they too can ask us what they need from downtown? Thank you. Um, Nick? To uh, get all income levels to live in the urban core, we'd have to work on affordability. And I don't have all the answers, but I am uh, somebody that would form a team to figure out exactly how to do that. And so I would listen to people, I would form a team of experts, and we could work together to figure out how to exactly do that in the urban core area. I did used to live in Manhattan, and one idea is they do there, or at least when I lived there, they had like a stipend program for people who are in the working class so that they can live near where they work. And so that could be an idea we can throw around. I'm not really sure. I'm not the expert, so. But I am a person that listens to experts and likes data. Thank you. Keisha. I think some of the actions that the city, the mayor and the city council can take to increase the appeal to individuals to live in the urban core is you, we give them more of what people want. People move into neighborhoods and environments because of primarily opportunities, whether or not it's opportunities for their kids, opportunities for them to, for employment, opportunities for housing. So with those three benchmarks in mind, I would definitely encourage the city council to, as a member, ensure that one, we have continued uh, educational opportunities. I think some of the great 
things of ASU, I'm sorry, of the downtown, is the ASU prep schools that downtown has. And we need to definitely market those a little bit more so individuals are aware of those. The housing situation, we definitely need to have more affordable and different um, levels of, of housing models here in downtown to appeal to individuals. We need to probably expand a little bit more of our parks here in downtown, in the downtown area, so people feel like there is a green space for their families to grow. Because many times downtown living entails more of apartment type structures. So we want to make sure that there is some type of green space for the kids to have traditional games and stuff like that in the downtown area. And also, um, I think one of the things the city does well is the support of events like the gain events, which create a sense of neighborhoods for individuals living in those areas. And I think we definitely need to have more of those in the downtown area. To um, Many people view sometimes a downtown living experience as very more sterile and more modern and not the traditional family approach. And I think that is one thing that the city can do a little different is to bring a little bit more family-focused initiatives to the city, the core area, so that you get more of those items. And of course, we're doing a great job, I think, of bringing more economic opportunities here. So we're getting more jobs so people can feel like they can be employed in the area. Because a goal for many people is to live, is to work, play, live, and, and where they work. They want kind of everything all in the same space. And I think we can do a better job uh, on doing that. So those are the items I think the city can do and focus on more. Thank you. So another important issue for our, our membership is arts and culture. Uh, while widely recognized as an economic driver for successful cities, arts and culture is currently allocated 5.2 million out of a $1.78 billion budget, representing 0.3% of the city's annual budget. This amount includes staff, grants, programs, public art maintenance, and the Cultural Facilities Fund. According to the last arts and economic study in 2015, the nonprofit art sector generated over 400 million in total economic activity, which has increased in the past seven years. As a council member, describe how you would support increased funding for a sector that provides a vital community service and has great economic impact to the city. And we're going to start with Carlos. Thank you. I'm really excited. I, I you know, from through the pandemic, we learned a lot, but we were also able to get funds from, from the federal government to be able to use um, for gaps that we had. And so on, while I was on council, we were able to advocate, get small grants for local artists and be able to grow that budget. One of the things I did this year was actually have uh, arts and culture specific um, meeting around the budget, a specific arts and culture budget item. And what I found, and, and you know, we've been hosting those the last three years, is how do we help, you know, a lot of times, we are looked at or people on council have taken the role of a broker. And I think it's how do we flip that? How do we facilitate conversations and make sure that whether it's the arts and culture community or other communities are able to have access, but also learn how to advocate for the things that they need. A lot of the beautiful arts and cultures things that, that we are currently have, whether it's the Children's Museum um, or some of the other programming that we have downtown, actually came from our last bond. So right now that we're in the middle of a bond, what does it look like for arts and culture? I know the Jewish Center and different folks have different needs, the, the expansion, the needs that um, uh, the, the Children's Museum needs as well. The Arizona Science Center under new leadership has some new ideas. How do we support those folks, whether it's through the bond or our general fund? I think it's really important for us to take the lessons that we learned of the gaps we were able to meet with the pandemic relief funds and be able to transfer that into our general fund. Now, you know, this year we're going to have the opportunity to hopefully advocate for some infrastructure funds. We have the bond coming. That's going to free up some of our general fund grants. Um, and in that conversation that we had with the arts and culture community, um, we actually brought up what other cities do. So comparable cities like Dallas and Houston um, do 10 or 15 times more the funds than we do. So I'll, I've done it and I will continue to advocate for more funds for arts and culture. Thank you. Nick? I believe arts and culture are very important to a city and, a, and uh, uh, a society, and I would like to see more funds for that. I don't know how that looks with budgeting and all that stuff, because I'm a numbers guy, you'd have to look at it. I'd also like to hear from my constituents. So uh, the 
people in District 8, I'd like to know exactly what type of arts and cultural things that they would like, uh, because I would be a District 8 council, uh, council person, so I uh, would like to hear from my constituents. And also, I think that the City of Phoenix could do more to advertise the arts and culture of the city, maybe on their social media, with their videos, and with their posts, because um, I follow uh, the City of Phoenix, and I don't see too much stuff about it, but it would be nice that the city of Phoenix embraced more of the arts and culture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Keisha. I, def I, I also agree that arts and culture is very important to our city. I think it's m m many of us as we travel, we go and we, when we visit other cities, we, we go for the things that are, that are, um, that represents that city. And I think Phoenix definitely ca can do more as the numbers show that they get 0.3% of the city's budget, but the return on investment is over 80 times. So I definitely think that is something, I would definitely use that data to argue or to lobby um, philanthropic organizations to partner with the city. Um, I think that partnerships with private institutions, local as well as federal organizations can help get more arts and cultures here to our city. We are the fifth largest city. Um, there are things uh, I think that we should have as a city that we don't have in terms of arts and culture. And sometimes there are, there are a number of foundations that we can reach out to for that type of support. It doesn't always have to come from the city's bond or general fund. I think if we are able to show how those funds are actually pre present a return financially as well as socially to our community, I think that's a great way for us to get increased funding for those items that don't necessarily have to come out of taxpayers' dollars pocket. So, Thank you. And lastly, Denise. Art and culture is my middle name. And I want to apologize because question number four, I was so excited about art and culture that I kind of answered that on number four instead of number five. But I'm, I want to add that one of the best way that we can attract family uh, in private sector to downtown Phoenix, we need to create more family-friendly neighborhood. We do have uh, the, the college kids that come in. We have the, uh, the private condos that we have a lot of uh, single uh, um, husband and wives and maybe just a single male or female. So I think that we can make it more family friendly uh, and if, by creating better programs, uh, secure area, uh, children's park. I think that will be a great way for us to also work with developers. But as far as my question for uh, art and culture, and I'm sorry, I, I get all excited. Um, I think one way that the city council can help um, without having to spend a lot of the funds that they already have is by making it uh, people friendly, organization friendly. A few years back, I tried to create a Dominican festival, festival right here at Mar Margaret T. Hans Park. It cost me an arm and a leg. The requirement, the police presence, the, um, the, the guarding uh, of, 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 of the park area, um, the, the fees that I have to pay to get the permit, it basically didn't make it worth it for me. And I think a lot of time people run away from that. So I think if we can work together, we are in small organizations such as mine that try to bring culture to downtown Phoenix. I think that this is the best way that we can probably save money, invest money, and bring culture to downtown Phoenix. Thank you. Next question is the current downtown strategic vision uh, was last reviewed and adopted by Phoenix City Council in 2004. How are you prepared to work with PCA and other stakeholders to review and update the downtown strategic vision? And are there any particular areas of the strategic plan that you feel require additional focus? And we're gonna start with Nick. Uh, the one thing with the strategic plan, I, uh, the vision plan, is uh, with the light rail and the downtown area like I talked about earlier, I think it's actually something we can do is make this uh, a walkable area here with more dense structures. And Margaret Hans Park, you know, I've I been to the uh, Japanese, um, the Japanese uh, uh, 
Thank you so much. The Friendship Garden, I'm sorry. The Friendship Garden. I walk around and I'm like, this is really great because of the shade and all the stuff in there. And it would be really neat to partner with developers that believe in the shade, believe in cooling down uh, downtown Phoenix here. And so that would that is what I uh, see that would really benefit the downtown area would be to have a lot of shade down here. And you could do that by different structures, uh, different parts of buildings, trees. And, you know, I walk down at the park at Margaret Hans Park and, uh, you know, they, we have big fields of grass and those are utilized sometimes. Sometimes I see them and they're just brown and they're not like a soccer field or anything. And I would like to see more trees at the parks, especially that park. That's my own personal opinion. I'm just a real person that has uh, my own personal opinions, but I'd like to see more trees in the downtown area and a lot more shade. And um, yeah, that's what I'd like. Thank you. Keisha. The question is how am I prepared to work with PCA and the other stakeholders to review and update the strategic vision? Um, Yes, definitely down for that. I would definitely want to have a series of meetings and making sure, similar to how we're doing the bond initiative, we have separate, I mean, you, I already know that PCA has several subcommittees, and I would definitely want to hear from those subcommittees. They have been the boots on the grounds, um, identifying and reviewing the issues, so I definitely want to hear their perspective on it. As for me, um, the personal er particular areas I think that require um, additional focus, Right now, I think, is our transportation portion of the strategic plan, as well as the, the residential or the housing component of the plan. I think we are doing a decent job on the economic and the small business, but I would like to increase that just a little bit more. We are definitely seeing a lot more growth when it comes to the addition of the new hotels here in this area. Uh, more students are in the area, so I would definitely want to make sure we also have the proper infrastructure here in downtown um, as part of our strategic plan to make sure that we are able to sustain that level of growth and continue to move forward. So yes, I am prepared to work with them and to hear from the PCA. Um, I have my own ideas, but I definitely would like to hear from those that have ex that live it and experience it every day and are more um, hands-on from that portion. So. Thank you. Uh, Denise. Well, uh, Mr. Alvarez, before I continue, I'd like to say that based on the information that I gather from the website, you are doing an absolute amazing job of helping the city grow responsibly. And the work that you have done inspire me to work with you more of helping the city grow responsibly making sure that downtown Phoenix is safe with our law enforcement, making sure that our public transportation is also safe and clean for our people and our community members that do not live in the downtown city area to feel safe to take the rail from North Phoenix, South Phoenix, Tempe, Mesa, to come here and invest into the growth of the uh, of downtown Phoenix. But one other thing, again, that attracts, attracts me the most is the cultural part of this organization. And I would like to uh, play a big part of making sure that we become more diverse. And if we are already diverse, to bring the best culture and the best out of people who are coming here from many part of the world, as well as the nation. Thank you. But uh, all credit goes to staff and our thousand of members, so better appreciate it. Uh, Carlos? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what I would respond to this is every strategic plan or any plan or vision that we have is only as strong as the resources allocated to it. Absolutely, I think, you know, anything that's been done with almost nearly 20 years ago needs to be updated. But I also know that there's a lot of new, new players. You know, some of the events that, you know, the farmer's market's been great and there's a lot of new folks coming in. You know, we've done events like the Right to Work Day um, that's bringing a lot of different uh, new and, and diverse voices into downtown. I think it's how do we incorporate all those folks and, and line them with PCA and with everybody else that's in the room now to make sure that we have a great strategy moving forward that even though some things may have happened as an accident, 
uh, in the past with, with, with what I referred to earlier, I think we actually can, can start looking at what the city is going to look like. And so as we look at corridors leaving downtown, you know, we're in the conversations with McDowell and Van Buren about possible road diets. Um, what is that? How do we incorporate the downtown voices? How do we incorporate um, into the new strategic, strategic vision? Um, light rail is a shift. Um, a lot of things have shifted, and I think we've all agreed today that since 2004 until now, this is a whole different place. And so definitely looking forward to a new strategic vision, a new plan, but more importantly, what are the resources that we're going to allocate to it? What are the funds that we're going to set up? Um, and I always tell people this story. Um, the, the best deal that anyone has downtown is the Suns Arena, right? Because they know that there's going to be a fund there for anything that they need moving forward. What is the equivalent of that? As we increase micromobility and need charging stations, what do funds that those things can produce look like to making sure that they're allocated for downtown uh, infrastructure and things that may come out of this plan? Thank you. Thank you. So each of you have done a tremendous job of keeping your answers under two minutes or less that we're actually ahead of time. So if you don't mind, uh, the membership submitted a couple of additional questions that I'd like to ask. Um, we are going to start with um, Keisha. And the question is, what efforts do you intend to take to support historic preservation? That's an interesting question. It's a really good question. I think um, that we definitely, I, I believe we have to be intentional in historic preservation because as we continue to grow as a city, we are trying to increase additional units. But I think we can actually do that in a manner that incorporates a lot of our historic situations, historic buildings, without um, undermining the actual process of growth. I believe in a more of a eclectic mix when it comes to development. I believe that we can preserve our historic neighborhoods like our our Garfield neighborhoods and Margaret Hage Hans Park. We can do all of that and weave in more of our unconventional type of homes, such as I believe in seeing more of like container homes, the tiny homes. I think we can build something that is uniquely Phoenix while preserving the historical context. Um, efforts I would be definitely supportive of our continued support of our village planning committees, because I believe that they have a great insight into our neighborhoods as to what is acceptable or what is permit permissible within the community. It keeps that specific um, hands-on approach to um, growth in our different in our different regions. Um, and I actually would support it in finding, I believe the city should also play a financial contributor in preserving some of the historic, as well as partnering with the national, of course, historic preservation boards. There's a number of things that I think we can do to continue to keep our historic preservation or keep our history intact while also extending our growth. And I am in support of looking to see how we can move all, move all of those forward. Thank you. Um, Denise. Growing responsibly is key. We have to make sure that our historic um, arena is preserved. There's a lot of history here in downtown Phoenix, not only downtown Phoenix, but as well in South Phoenix. And one of the uh, issues that I hear from many of our constituents is that they are the gentrification of our city is pushing people away. Uh, whether it is a um, art program, whether it is the, uh, the science center, whether it is a humble home, small business owned by a mom and pops. And I think that we need to bring our constituents into these meetings before we make any major decision of rebuilding or continue to build in the Phoenix uh, metropolitan area. So historic preservation is very big for me and it's one of the things that I have on my palm card is making sure that we preserve the history of Phoenix, Arizona. I've seen it grow since 1986 when the majority of these buildings were not even here. I welcome it, but I think it's important that we also uh, support those businesses, those art centers, those historic businesses that can bring history and, and, and we can learn so 
we have to create ways that we can bring the family, bring the children, so we can continue to have this build, uh, this uh, historical uh, organization open and, and, and support, not only financially, but also uh, making sure that we protect them and we preserve them. Thank you. Uh, Carlos? The first thing that, that comes to mind with this and looking at some of the folks in the crowd is um, something we had to do with the Banner Hospital on 7th Street in McDowell, right? So historic building, folks were asking us to preserve it, but when we toured the buildings themselves, they were no longer, re they weren't available or, or, or we weren't able to do the things that needed to be done with modern medicine, whether it was Wi-Fi connectivity, whether it was the size of the beds that were able to go in and out of, of the different buildings. And so, okay, there was obviously a need, and I think anyone with common sense would say we need a new hospital, we need a new tower um, to be able to do what the hospital needs to do, especially with modern medicine. But I think what was great about that is we were able to come to a compromise and figure out how is it in the lobby, how is it in other ways in the construction, can you actually still um, acknowledge, recognize, and appreciate what was there, but making sure we were able to modernize, especially something so important like a hospital. And so I do believe, you know, I support historic preservation. I also um, would put a, another point in this is, is what history are we preserving? I think a lot of times what happens in our historic preservation meetings or, or, or you know, or, or how people come is people who are well off, maybe in some of the, the Willow neighborhood and those neighborhoods are able or appreciate or push for certain things. And a lot of, especially the black and brown history of the city has been erased. How we've seen and how we've treated the Nuestro Barrios neighborhood um, as, as, ex, as the airport has expanded. You know, we have a building there, the Santa Rita Hall, where Cesar Chavez did a 25 day fast. And it should be something we treasure. It should be something we incorporate, include into downtown. And so I think it's very important, yes, that, that we do historic preservation, that we continue to fund it, um, that we, when, when opportunities come up, that we do creative ways of, of acknowledging what was there, but making sure that there's equity in that conversation as well. Thank you. Nick. I'm somebody that is big on historic preser preservation. And so I don't want to touch any of the historic neighborhoods or anything, actually. Um, I really care deeply about history and culture. And I think that um, a lot of these neighborhoods uh, have that. And I would like to see more investment in that. And maybe, you know, there's ways that maybe there's tours, like Carlos said about uh, the, the Cesar Chavez house. Uh, I don't know if they took, did they? you know, have tours and things like that with our historic neighborhoods and make it almost like a tourism type thing. And so that's uh, my plan. Thank you. So the last question before we move on to our closing statements, it's with regards to the general obligation bond. Um, as you all know, the city of Phoenix is in the process of evaluating a lengthy list of projects for possible funding through the bond. What proposed projects do you think are the most critical for downtown Phoenix? And we're gonna start uh, with Denise. I'm going to be honest with you. That is a question that I have to study, and then I will get uh, back to you. I'm not going to sit here and try to sign, sound smart about things that I have not uh, looked into yet. But one thing I will tell you, if it's good for the people, if it's good for the city, I will go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos? Yeah, I mean, I think, one, we've waited way too long for this bond to happen. I'm glad it's happening. I wish it was larger. I've, I've advocated in, in the council meeting that I wish it was twice as big as it was. Because as we've gone through the committees or just listening to the needs of folks, it gets really hard to start deciding what we choose or we don't choose, right? When you see the, what, what the Children's Museum, what you know, the Jewish Center, what other folks are asking for, some of the infrastructure needs down here. I know ASU has a proposal um, to support in some of the street closures. I think they're all important. Um, the problem we have is we have two set, the way this bond is gonna work is 250K in 24 and 250 in 26. It's gonna be really hard to incorporate all that. I know last time we did a bond, about a third of it came to downtown, a lot of it through the ASU projects. Um, and so 
uh, I think we, there's going to be some projects that are going to be left out. And so what do we do to prioritize the, the tier two, tier three projects that may get left out this time and look for partnerships or look to speed up a bond or figure out how we can get those taken care of. Because um, the reality is we need fire stations, we need parks upgrades, we need a lot of those things all around the city. Um, and so instead of you know pinning everyone against each other is how do we come up with a plan to either make sure, because that's our, that's our commitment this time, that in five years we do another bond or see if there's still a possibility, and I'm still trying, um, to grow this bond. Maybe if it's, it's, it's 100 more, 100 million more, or, or whatever we can do to make sure that a lot of those needs are met. Um, and thankful, I know some of you all in PCL are part of the bond committee, so thank you for your service. We're gonna be looking at what the recommendations come, um, and we'll definitely be supporting, uh, especially the projects that are in District 8. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I think, I think dealing with uh, fixing infrastructure is really, really important with the, the water crisis and also uh, updating existing buildings for energy saving because that will save money along, uh, you know, uh, um, through the years. Uh, also, uh, I think that the parks are a good thing because that's where our community goes to have events and for families to go. I think that's important, street safety. Um, but I think number one is infrastructure. I think we need to work with the, uh, we need to figure out the infrastructure thing so we can continue to develop and have a safe city. Thank you. Tisha. I will agree with uh, Carlos on that. I do wish that the bond initiative uh, obligation was a little bit higher because there are a number of worthy projects that just we don't have the capacity to to do all of them um, but if i had to pick one of them the sub the two the one subcommittee that i probably would focus on is just given our current situation is homelessness um sorry housing human services and homelessness because i think that is an issue that has definitely just been affecting all of us um, and i definitely would focus on the environment and sustainability we have continued to grow as a city as a and we definitely need to make sure that we are doing it in a productive manner i also have a soft spot for the parks and recreation centers um, as we continue to grow we need to ensure that there are places for our next generation to experience the basic fun things of playing in the park playing a game in the park or a community center where they build relationships where we do become more uh, community-based and neighborhood friendly those are the things that I definitely think are important and we also have to consider um, our infrastructure and I'm talking about just our general um, the fire station is a great example. We don't have enough fire stations here in the city as we've continued to grow. We need to definitely prioritize that as well. Um, our first responders, they need better equipment for certain things and we need to make sure that they're able to receive those as well. So um, it's hard to pick, but I do believe we have to, I, my priorities would be based on the ones that give the greatest impact to the greatest amount of people for the return on investment. Uh, and unfortunately, because I don't have my unlimited checkbook to write whatever policies that we want, we would have to look and determine which ones give the biggest rate of return on investment. And we also have to look at those that, those areas that have been um, ignored for some time that are some, that need to be, uh, need to be brought up to speed. Those will also be the things that I'll be focusing on. So thank, you. thank you. And thank you each for uh, providing your answers to these very important questions. Uh, now we're going to move on to closing statements. So in two minutes or less, Please let us know what you have accomplished or achieved that makes you the most qualified candidate to serve as a city council member. And we're gonna start with Keisha. I would say what qualifies me to be a city council member, um, one, I have the legal, tr I have the training, I'm able to consensus build. I'm able to see things and analyze a problem and focus on how do we get to a solution. I'm able, I, as we probably all know, a city council person does not work by themselves. You have to be able to get the consensus and get the buy-in of not only your community, but as well as the other members of council to get anything done. 
Um, so I think that is a skill set I think is helpful. The other thing that I think um, from an accomplishment standpoint, I am driven. If I am committed to something, you will get 110% of what I have. I graduated from undergrad at the age of 19, law school at 22. Um, that did not come from happenstance. That came from dedication and grit. And that's the same skill set I will bring to city council. I have been practicing for 20 years. I have represented a variety of basis. I have represented the small pop. I have represented those that cannot afford uh, representation. I've been represented banks and the government. If I believe in a process, if I believe in something, I'm going to push it to the end. And the other thing I think is most important is I'm doing this from a place of my heart, from my passion. I really want to see better for our city. It, 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 I, I believe that a, this city should provide opportunities for all. I would not be sitting on this stage if, it, if I were not granted the opportunities for all. I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I worked hard and I believe that we need to have a path for all individuals to get to this place. I think there are some things that are simply out, unattainable right now and we need to equalize that a little bit more. Um, I am here for the people, I am here to represent our community, and I'm willing to look at it from a multifaceted aspect. There's not one thing I think is more important than others, and I want to listen, I want to be the voice for the community and represent the community to the best of my ability. So that's why I think I'm here. Well, thank you. And we're going to go in uh, reverse alphabetical order, so the next is Nick. Wait for there we go. Gotta wait for it. Uh, so uh, my background, um, I was a uh, behavior health administrator. I have dedicated my life for over 15 years helping people. That's my whole life has been not my whole entire life, but my almost my whole entire adult life has been to help people. And I sincerely care about District 8. I have a bachelor's degree from uh, NAU for public administration. I have ran five programs at a behavior health uh, company, nonprofit. I have worked with HUD housing. I understand all that stuff. I understand organizational management. I understand probably everything the city manager has to deal with so I can work with him and his team very well. I understand the need to uh, be able to work with other people. You know, there's a lot of challenges in Phoenix and we need somebody that can uh, Understand the constituents, because I know a lot of constituents. I have been knocking on doors for months and months, thousands of doors. And I have heard from the constituents, and I'm somebody that wants to represent District 8. Uh, my background, uh, you know, my num one of the number one things that I was known for was my, uh, the vice president of the company would come and they would have a program that was failing. I could go in there and re organize the entire program and streamline everything to where it was successful again. And that's what I want to do at City Council. I want to be somebody that is fiscally uh, responsible and can work with everybody involved and make the best decisions so our city can prosper. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos? Thank you. And I want to start off by thank you all again for, for having this forum and having this conversation. I think through the conversation, I've been able to show and tell some of the projects that we've done and accomplished in, in all the areas that were asked of. Um, I never thought of myself of being here. I was never in as a child in college or even in the five years before running for office that I think I was going to be taking this position. But when I was asked to do this, when the community asked me to do this, I took it very serious. And in the last three and a half years, I believe I've proven not only to myself, my family, those colleagues or the folks that asked me to run for, but the entire community that we've been able to deliver on a variety of issues from homelessness, from, from everything that we've talked about today, we've been able to deliver. And so through the pandemic, I actually was really grateful that I had the opportunity to be able to see the gaps that were there and to be able to implement some of the things that we did it really made it worth um, going through this, going through the long hours of knocking on doors and fundraising and all those things it takes to be on council. Um, I'm really excited to, to be able to move the, a lot of the things that we started working on forward. 
when I first got in, I wanted to change everything quickly. Um, and the, one of the things I saw was actually there was lenses or, or certain aspects that either my colleagues on council or city staff themselves were missing. And so what we set out to do and the things I'm really proud of is actually set systematic change. So it's not that we're only doing cool pavement in Garfield, but we actually started a first of its kind heating mitigation office that's now gonna make sure that heat mitigation is looked at in everything that we do. The same thing with setting up an equity office, the same thing with setting up the Office of Accountability and Transparency, and all the other projects that we've done, I feel like we've not only um, addressed issues and fixed them, but also made sure that the entire system knows that those issues are present and are going to have systems to work on them moving forward. So I'd be excited to get another four years and continue to do the things that we've been, been doing representing District 8. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Denise. Well, let me tell you about passion. As someone that is an immigrant to this country and appreciate the benefit in the American dream, I'm very passionate at making sure that the city still stay, stay safe, that our people receive the representation that they need. I know we can sit here and we can talk about future plannings or how we're going to grow the city, how we're going to grow downtown Phoenix, but if we don't have public safety, and if we don't help the unsheltered and the homeless, if we don't stop the drug problem that are coming to our community, to our schools, to our families, that is not even, um, even worth talking about. Everything is important. Growth is important. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we're here to represent the people. As someone who used to be homeless before, as someone that used to be a, a mother, a single mother that worked three jobs, as someone that struggled financially, as someone that is married to a police officer and I see the struggle and the frustration on our police department because they're not getting support from the council members that continue to attack them. As someone that has over thousands of families in my database through my organization called Padres Unidos, which is a Parents United, an organization that represents the voice of the voiceless. I am able, I am teachable, I am trainer, I, you can train me to learn those little levels of things that I right now don't understand, but I tell you one thing, I will be the best representation of the city because we need to have public safety, we need to clean our city, we need to help those who are on drugs right now, we need to find, we need to work with organizations that are willing to help and that are being overlooked, and we need prevention program for our youth, because the only way that we can prevent more homelessness is working with our young men and women who need program and representation and prevention program. Thank you. Thank you. Now, so this concludes today's forum. On behalf of uh, PCA's membership, I want to thank each of you for taking time out of your busy schedules. I know you're all busy, so thank you for being here. I also want to thank each of you and those watching virtually uh, for joining us to listen to the ideas uh, that were shared by these candidates um, as they positioned themselves to be one of uh, eight council members and lead the city of Phoenix. Uh, please be sure to cast your vote in this critical election on November 8th or mail in your ballot beforehand. For more information, please visit City of Phoenix election page at phoenix.gov slash elections. Again, that's phoenix.gov slash elections. And lastly, I want to plug PCA. To get more involved in our organization, uh, please visit our website. Um, if you enjoyed today's forum, uh, we plan uh, additional forums uh, for some of the city council candidates uh, in the near future. Um, so please, uh, we would love to have you engaged. And uh, for those of you who aren't members, um, please uh, come up and uh, we would be glad to, to show you how to become a member. So again, thank you so much and uh, have a pleasant day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.